People find out I've been on Dance with the Stars. I always get the same three questions. One, are the dancers really that good, or is it all done with smoke and mirrors? Two, if you've seen the show, there's a lot of good-looking people on that show, so I always get the question, is there any hanky-panky going on between the dancers and the stars? Because I know you were thinking that if you've seen the show. And three, how in the heck did you get on that show? Because I know you're not a star, and I hope you didn't dance. Well, let me tell you, I didn't dance. Case in point, I'm a terrible dancer. This is my wedding dance. That's my lovely bride, Tommy. Yes, I'm very lucky. Uh, I don't know how it happened, but it did. And if you look sh very closely, she's gritting her teeth, and she's saying, why do we waste all that money on lessons? So basically, no, I'm a terrible dancer. Uh, I didn't inherit a dance gene, but our son did, Miles. And he's doing that 80 shuffle, if you're wondering. I taught him that move. But <clears throat> I didn't dance on the show. What I did on the show was explain to the audience how these stars could handle all the pressure. Because I know maybe some of you haven't seen the show, but I bet your wives or your girlfriends have seen the show. <clears throat> and the way the show works is this. You have these stars, and they have to learn a dance week in and week out, a new dance, so there's a lot of pressure. They're being judged, and it's live in front of 20 million people. And I had to talk about how to handle that pressure. Well, that same pressure relates to your lives. And I can use Bill as an example, because I've spoken to him a lot of times about the pressure that he handles. He's traveling all the time. He has a family. Uh, sometimes your vision of what you're doing is not aligned with the administration. A lot of times you're working with uh, elite athletes that are not motivated, especially if they're on a losing season. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much pressure on you day in and day out. And there's pressure not only in your job, there's pressure on you to be a great spouse, a great father, mother, whatever. There's so much pressure on you. And you have to be great at work and you have to be great at home. So the question is, how can you be great? And the simple answer is emotional mastery. When you master your emotions, you master your world. When you have power over your confidence, power over your anxiety and fears, you master your world. And for the last 30 years, I've worked with some of the greatest athletes in the world. I've worked with uh, people from the NBA. I've worked with people from the NFL, the PGA. I've worked with CEOs uh, from Fortune 500 companies. And I've worked with people just like you. And everybody asks me, what's the one main difference? Why do some people are so successful and some people don't ever reach their potential? And I relate it like this. You have a lot of talents. I have a lot of talents. Everybody has talents. But sometimes people have emotions that push their talents down and they never <clears throat> achieve their potential. Other people have emotions that push their talents up and it raises their game. And the easy way to explain this, and I do this in my class, is with this orange. And Bill, did you see this? Did I do this when you were in my class? OK. First question, if I squeeze this orange, what comes out? It's easy. Come on. Juice. Orange juice. Orange juice always comes out. Second question, a little harder. Why? Why does orange juice come out? Come on. It's an orange. Close. Pressure. It's an orange. The answer is because that is what is inside. Level three question, what have you put inside? If you put in fear and negativity and doubt, that's what you get when you get squeezed. Because we all get squeezed under pressure. And if you put in joy and compassion and peace of mind and confidence, that's what you get when you get squeezed, because we all get squeezed. That is the human condition. And so it's my goal this morning to share with you how to put in the right juice. And also, not only for you, but how to help others that you work with put in the right emotional juice. Because you don't need a title to be a leader. And everybody in here is a leader. And every time you're working with someone, you are in a leadership position. And the idea here is, not only do you have to put in the right juice, but you have to help others put in the right juice. And that's my goal, to share with you how to do that. And to, to kind of start with that, um, the idea is I kind of want to share with you the overall framework. I typically like a visual to kind of understand how the program works. 
And I'm going to share with you part of the program. And just so you know, um, everyone gets a book, of course. But you also get, um, I talked to Bill about this. I created this thing called the Emotional Toughness University. And it's an online course. So uh, after the event, I'm going to send you, every, everybody's going to get a code. So you can get on there. It's got videos, articles, and applied exercises. So you can actually enhance your expertise. But part of that program relates to this. And it's about, it starts with awareness. You have to be aware of your best emotions, and you have to be aware of what emotions make you choke. And then you have to basically prep yourself with primers, words, actions, and images, which push your emotions in the right direction. And then when you get squeezed, those great emotions come out. That's the emotional triad. And I guarantee you, you've seen this before. I know you've seen it with players. You've probably seen it in stories. And, and let me give you a, a story, one of my favorite stories to illustrate how elite athletes do this. And it's with Muhammad Ali. Uh, I know everyone knows who he is. Who he, uh, I know he passed recently. But long before he was boxing champion of the world, he grew up very poor in Louisville. His, uh, his mother could barely afford food, let alone toys. And y the young Muhammad Ali, back then known as Cassius Clay, thank you, another great name. He saw this blue bike, it was a Schwinn, had a great um, handlebars, leather seat, and that great emblem. And man, he wanted this bike really bad. So all summer long, he worked at a grocery store, boxing groceries, and he finally had enough money for that blue bike. Handed the shopkeeper the money, rode all over Louisville the next day, showing off to his friends and his family. And that bike was a bomb, and he loved that bike. And the next day, he parked it in front of the grocery store, made sure the lock was nice and tight, went to work, came back from work. Someone had clipped the lock and stolen his bike. And the young Muhammad Ali never found his bike again, and he never found out who stole his bike. But we all know this guy is a true champion. And he harnessed that negative energy into a positive form of juice that he could use. And so every time he would step in the ring, he'd point at his opponent and say, you're the guy who stole my blue bike. True story, right? He's using these primers. Words, you're the guy, and he's pointing, and he's basically thinking of his blue bike. And if you look, I know you've seen this again and again and again. All over the world, the most successful people use this system to find the right juice when they need it. Just as an example, does anybody know what this movie's from? Or this picture, what movie? Wolf of Wall Street, right? And that's Matthew McConaughey, <clears throat> top of, of his profession. He's actually, what he does for his primer is he pumps his chest three times to find the right juice. And actually, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio saw that. He said, let's put that in the movie. And he's actually across from Leonardo in this one scene while he's pumping his chest. <clears throat> Everybody does this system. If you look at it, uh, some form or fashion, most people do this system to find the right juice. But the question is, if we're talking about emotional mastery, and we're talking about how to find the right juice, we got to figure out what the right juice is for for you to fill yourself and also fill the players you're working with so that they will be inspired, they'll be motivated, they'll have the right attitude every time they go into the, the weight room when you're working with them. And so um, the question is, I have to ask you uh, a, an important question, uh, and, and we all know emotions are powerful. They can make you super happy. They can make you sad. They can make you inspired. And so the real question that I want to ask you, and, and, and um, write this down on the back of the sheet. Let's see if uh, this is a, a little coaching system I'm going to share with you a little bit later. But I want to ask you a question, and I bet there's no one in this room that's going to get this answer. What is the primary emotion? What emotion is on the top rung that leads to all these other powerful positive emotions like grit? like confidence, like peace of mind, like perseverance, like, like all these powerful emotions. What is the top emotion? So go ahead and write it down. And, I'll, and I'm going to answer that in a minute. But I want to see if you can get that. And I'm going to guarantee nobody gets it. All right. So I'm going to answer that. I'm not going to ask you yet. I know this is going to be interactive in a minute. But I want to I share with you the answer. And it's going to take a couple minutes. But I think you're going to find what I'm going to share with you is uh, very interesting. And actually, it's brand new research. So you, you've never seen it before. It's research I've done. But it's very powerful research. And it really started about 10 years ago. David Meder, he's a national blind golf champion. He came to my class. 
and he's come to my class a bunch of times. And he talks to my class about the, uh, how he plays golf blind. If you're wondering, you have a coach and you line him up. But he also tells my class about this horrific accident, how he's coming over the hill way too fast. His, his car bashes into the tree. His head bashes in the windshield and puts him in a coma. And when he awakens in the hospital, the doctor's standing over him and says, David, you sever your ocular nerve. You're going to be blind for the rest of your life. So from the age of 18 to now 67, he's been blind. And he tells my class that the accident changed him to his core. Before, he was uncaring, unfocused, uncompassionate. And then after the accident, he became much more focused, much more caring, much more focused uh, about the world. He actually tells my class blindness, blindness allowed him to truly see what was important in his life, like friends and family. He also tells my class he's the only man in America who could walk through Home Depot and never see anything he wants. But that's, that's his joke, not mine. Um, but what David Netter allowed me to see was that the old science of loss was incomplete. Uh, and so what I did was I investigated these people who had tragedy, and I wanted to see how they turned tragedy into transcendence. And so I investigated people from all over the world who said they had this terrible, painful event, yet they became better for it. They had transcendence. And what I discovered was, to my amazement, is that they went through these four stages. There was this wake-up call. Like they realized they weren't on their path, and then they flipped the switch. They realized this painful moment had purpose in their life, and then they used strengths and talents that they never knew existed because they're moving out of their comfort zone, and then they found their life song, their purpose. And I know you've seen these stages. If you look closely, you've seen these stages. There's actually a famous um, story. Does anybody know, remember Petra Nankova? She was that supermodel. Um, she was on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and um, she was vacationing with her boyfriend. A tsunami came and um, took him out to sea, and he lost his life. And that wave was so powerful. It broke her hips, but it raised her so high. She's hanging on to the palm fronds of, uh, of a palm tree for eight hours in terrible pain, but that didn't compare to the psychic pain. Because as she's hanging on, she hears these children hang, uh, yelling for dear life, help me, help me. And she couldn't do anything because she couldn't let go because she knew she'd be a goner like they were. But when the water receded, she said, I'm going to start a charity. I'm going to start a charity to help children. And she started a charity. And because she never started a charity before, she got out of her comfort zone. She realized strengths and talents she never knew existed. And she started this charity called Happy Hearts Fund. And it's opened up these charities from around the world. And she found her purpose. And the idea here is this, that I don't know what it is, but it's kind of the human irony, and that is the darkness in our life allows us to see the light. It shines the light. And light is our essence. Purpose is our essence. Purpose is the master emotion. Who wrote purpose? Nobody did. You know why? Because nobody thinks purpose is an emotion, but it is. Think about this. You're coming out of the grocery store. You see this lady. She has a sign that says, needs food, she has two kids, and you usually don't do this, but you take out a 20 and you give it to her, and she says, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. What do you feel at that moment? You feel purposeful, full of purpose. Purpose is a master emotion, and it leads to courage, it leads to grit, it leads to passion, it leads to love, it leads to everything that you're looking for in your life and to help others in their life. And just as an example, you see it in history. And everybody knows this story. It's about two bicycle makers, and they're on a, in a race. Uh, but it's not a bicycle race. It's a worldwide race to build the first flying machine. And the whole world's in this race. England has a team with the greatest scientists and all the money from the government. France has a team with the greatest scientists, and, and, and they have all the money and all the great scientists. These guys are from Akron, Ohio. Yeah, near Akron, Ohio, yeah. And they basically are taking the money from the bicycle works to fund their flying machine. But they won the race. And who am I talking about? Right? The Wright brothers, right? And everybody sees this as the iconic picture, 1903 at Kitty Hawk. But you know what happened? You know how long they flew at this moment? 18 seconds. That's it. And you know, Wilbur said, there's no way that's going to change the world. And it didn't. It really, the, the media didn't take hold of that at all. So he said, we're going to have to fly a lot longer. 
And he said, but if we're going to do this, his brother, Or Orville, said, we can never fly together because it's so dangerous. So they never flew again together. In fact, Orville crashed so bad he could never fly again. But five years later, in France, actually, they flew for an hour. And that was the change of aviation history. And when they asked Wilbur why he did it, he didn't say, I love flying. He didn't say, I was passionate about flying. You know what he said? He said, I wanted to change the world. I wanted to teach the world how to fly. That was his purpose. Purpose is the master emotion. And it leads to all this grit. It, it leads to peace of mind. It leads to everything that you're seeking in your life and that you're trying to help others to become successful. And when you fill your life full of purpose and you fill their life full of purpose, that's when they become the people they're meant to be. And you, if you listen to great leaders uh, of late, they'll say the same things. For instance, does anybody, I'm sure everybody in here saw the, uh, the championship football game, right, for collegiate when Clemson beat um, uh, Alabama. You guys watch that? Yes. I'm a Bama fan, so I got a little uh, hurt. I used to work for the Bama football team, and so I was a little bit upset, but it was an amazing game. And when Dabo Sweeney was, as soon as he was interviewed, he said this quote, I teach my players this, let the light within be brighter than the light that shines on you from the outside. He was saying that, look, the accolades, the winning, the praise, that stuff will never be enough. That stuff will never be enough. The light on the inside, purpose, has to overcome that. That has to be your prime priority. And when that is, you'll overcome all those tornadoes. You'll overcome all those difficulties in your life. And that's what he was trying to tell his players. That's how he raised them to achieve at the highest level. He knew it. And so if you listen to great leaders, they share with their players. And I know you know, you know this story, right? LeBron James, everybody I know this story. But I don't know if you know like the whole picture, right? And I, I'm not, uh, um, I don't work with LeBron James, but I, I listen to everything he says because when a guy at this level says stuff, you need to listen. And what I, what I learned from LeBron is that, you know, he started in Cleveland, right? He came from Akron, Ohio, and he played for uh, Cleveland, and that was his hometown. And I don't think he really... He did believe they were going to win, so he went to Miami, and they won a few championships, and then he went back to Cleveland. Do you know why? Because winning is never enough. And let me tell you a human truth. Winning is only the spice of life. Purpose is its main course. Purpose fills you up. Winning, money, praise, that will never be enough. Now, those things are great. Don't get me wrong but those won't fill you up. And that's what he discovered. And that's really why he went back to his hometown. Because he said, I'm gonna change them. I need to fill my life full of purpose. And that is why he left. And it's not about winning, it's about purpose. And you can see that everywhere. And so the question that I wanna ask you is, I know you wanna ask, how do you fill your life full of purpose? How do you help others fill their lives full of purpose? And that's what I want to share with you how I do that in my coaching. And so the first, um, let me give you an example. Um, but it's kind of based on that other principle we talked about. You have an awareness when you have a time in your life you were totally inspired. And then you create these notes to your life song. And then you play that song over and over again. So let me give you an example how this works in a coaching. Um, it's not, I, I wanted to share with you a powerful story. It's not a sports story. I do this in, in, with my athletes as well. But I wanted to share with you uh, a, a really cool story that I did with Mark Dansfield. Mark was a financial advisor. He was burnt out. It was 2009. It was right after the recession. And he's making a lot of money. He goes, look, I'm making a lot of money. I'm burnt out. And I need to find that inspiration. Can you help me, Doc? And I said, yeah. I can help you. I said, tell me a time when you're truly inspired. He said, well, you don't know uh, this about me, but I used to be Lieutenant Dansfield. And I was a medic. We were in Afghanistan, and we had this makeshift ER, and they flew Private Williams into our makeshift ER. Well, Private Williams was on this lookout. He was in a Humvee. His uh, colleagues were getting ambushed in this small village in Afghanistan. He got in the Humvee, drove down the hill, bullets flying everywhere. They jump in, and he rescues them, but he is riddled with five bullets. And he said, they flew him to the uh, makeshift ER, and I said, there's no way a guy with this much courage is going to lose his life. We worked on him for a few hours. He was in a coma for a week, but when he awoke, he gave me the thumbs up, and that was the, the time I was the most inspired. And I said, why are you inspired? And he said, because I was saving lives. And I said, well, now you're saving economic lives. So I said, let's do this. 
That's your buzzword. Remember we talked about words, actions, and images? Those are your primers. I said, you're going to use saving lives. That's your buzzwords. And he had on his iPhone actually a picture. I said, you should put a picture of yourself in army fatigues. And he did that. And I said, um, and then he had an image of basically every time you would think of an image of Private Williams giving him a thumbs up. And I said, every time you're taking a little dip in your emotions, every time you don't feel like it, you're unmotivated, I want you to say your words, actions, and images. So just like Muhammad Ali. And that's what he did. And that's how you coach people. So let's do it with you right now. And the first step is uh, on the sheet. Everyone should have this sheet. So let me tell you, we're doing this with you, but this is what you should be doing in the, in, the, in the weight room. When you find a player that's uninspired and you find a player that doesn't want to work out and just, you know, and it drains you and those players, you're interacting with those players, these are the kind of tools that I want you to use. This is why I'm, I'm here today, to give you kind of these tools because you don't need a personality test. That I don't give players personality tests. These are the things that are really powerful. And so why don't you go ahead and do this right now. Write down a time you were truly inspired. So tell, what, what, in a, and it could be in sport. It could be in work. Just write down a time you were truly inspired. A moment in your life that was just really inspirational for you. That you, that you created. That you changed. That you helped someone. That you, uh, you fulfilled some goal. Whatever it is. Just write down a sentence. Just write a sentence that you were truly inspired. You got to write it down because it works if you write it down. Just don't think about it. You got to write it down because you'll, you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. And then also write down why were you inspired. So like for private, um, for Lieutenant Dansville, because he was saving lives. He was changing lives. Why were you inspired at that moment? So you got to figure out why. And when you're working with a, 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 one of your athletes in the weight room, these are the kind of questions you want to ask him or her. I know most of you guys work with NBA players, but you want to ask him. And so the idea is that these are simple, powerful questions. But we're just doing it so you can write it down, so you'll see where I'm going with this. But this is a really, really powerful question that you want to engage your athletes with. OK, so a little interaction. Who wants to, who wants to uh, share? What was the time they were truly inspired? Don't be shy. You guys can't be shy. All right, Bill. Bill, you get an A. All right. So uh, well, when I was in Afghanistan in 2002, I, I painted this mural uh, on the uh, what's called it? It was showing kids how to play baseball. So one of the things they asked me on left field in this wall, I painted this big mural by a couple of guys in Afghanistan. And, and why, why did that inspire you? Right, you saw him smile that moment in time. It, it, it stays with you, right? But, you know, it's interesting that Bill, that was uh, 15 years ago. The moments that truly inspire you, they, they're, they're, they're locked in. You just got to get them out. You know, if I say uh, the bad events are locked in too, right? If I say 9-11, everybody knows exactly where they were when they heard about 9-11. And maybe you were frustrated. Maybe you're mad as heck. Whatever it is, you recall that moment. Well, these inspirational moments, they're locked in. Just like Bill was saying, that moment, you can see those kids, right? And it'll be with you forever. And Bill, I didn't know you had that much, you know, I knew you had other talents. I didn't know you were an artist, too, so that's cool. <laughs> so the idea here is those are the kind of things you want to ask your, your players, you know. Tell me a time you're truly inspired and why, okay? And, 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 and now you're getting to know your players at a deeper level, okay? That's real important. Okay, so the next step is... Um, now you want to create primers for them. Primers are these words, actions, and images that push their emotions in the right direction. And I think everyone can relate to the most powerful primer, and it's called music. Music can make us super happy, or it can, it can make us really sad if we hear a song that reminds us of a time we were sad. I think you can all re relate to this situation. I flew into Raleigh. I was doing a, a talk, and um, I'm 
going to the rental car. I don't know what took so long. It took 45 minutes to get my car. Now I'm getting a little upset. I just wanted to go to the hotel, have dinner, take a shower, and I get in traffic, and now I'm really getting upset. And all of a sudden, that song comes on the radio. And for me, it's Move Like Jagger by Maroon 5. I don't know what it is, but it just gets me. I just love that song. And all of a sudden, I start doing the thumb bop and the finger roll and the chicken. You guys know the chicken, right? I'm doing the chicken, and I don't realize I'm doing it, and I get to a light, and I turn, and it's a cop. And he's looking at me with that crazed look. And I knew exactly what he was thinking. He was thinking, that guy is one hell of a dancer. Okay, so you guys get that. But the idea is that when you find these words, actions, and images that can push your emotions like a song, think about how powerful that is. That's what primers are. They're, they're, these, they're so powerful that when you have the master of them, you will push your emotions in the right direction, and you will help others to push their emotions in the right direction. So just as a little, a little fun aside, I want to share with you some of the, po uh, the powers of these primers. Okay, so we got, we got split down the middle. This is kind of when we're a little more interactive and fun this morning. Okay, so you're group A, you're group B. Okay, don't forget your letter. Group A, group B. Okay, group B, turn away from the screen. I'm going to show group A a word. Okay, this is your word. Okay, group A, turn away from the screen. Now, group B, this is your word. Okay, group B, look at the screen. Okay, everybody look at the screen. Okay, what are you guys thinking about? What are you guys thinking right now? Chicken. Your word was, what was your word? Chicken. Who's thinking soap? Okay, you got to see me afterwards because there's something seriously wrong with you. What was your word? Wash. Wash. What are you guys thinking? Soap. Soap. Okay. You were supposed to think soup. All right. All right. Here's another. Well, the other thing is that words are the language of emotion. The, the words you use with your players, with yourself, totally changes your emotions. For instance, if you think about this player and this player always complains, you're going to have a different emotion than if you think this player makes suggestions, right? If you say this player is confident, you're going to have a different emotion than if you say this player is arrogant. So the idea is we want to be the master of our words. What we say about players, what we say to ourselves, totally changes our emotions. So here's another one, power of actions. Okay, group A, you're group B. Okay, group A, you have to fake a smile because I know it's going to be fake, okay? Group B, you have to scowl. Give me that little crinkle right here, okay? This is the actual experiment. We showed you a picture of the, uh, this is a famous cartoon by Gary Larson, the real reason dinosaurs became extinct, right? Because they were smoking, that's obvious. Well, the people that faked the smile, their laugh -o meter, they even, they enjoyed this more than the people that were scowling. Just by your actions, it pushes your emotions in a certain direction. And you know, if you get your players, let's say they're going to the weight room, and they're, they're, they don't, they're not inspired and they're walking like this in the weight room or whatever, their shoulders are slouched, they're not gonna be confident, they're not gonna be energized. You gotta get them energized. You gotta get their shoulders up, you gotta get them smiling. That's gonna energize them. Actions influences our emotions. So you gotta be aware of those and you gotta get on them about their actions as well. Okay, one more, we're not gonna do much, but the idea is group A, oh, I forgot to mention this, but if I put you in the doggy zen position, you'd be really relaxed too. But we're not going to do that today, okay, because we don't have time. Because uh, Bill told me i got to finish exactly 45 minutes or they're going to give me the yank. All right, so the idea is powerful emotions. Okay, so group A, we showed you a picture of older adults, and group B, we showed you a picture of younger adults. But the true experiment is we had you walk down the hall to another room. Do you know the pe people that saw the picture of older adults actually walked slower? And you're thinking, there's no way a picture of older adults is going to make me walk slower. It's true, because primers work in our subconscious. That's why advertisers spend millions and billions of dollars to make you buy stuff that you don't want, because they're using primers to push your emotions in the right direction. A couple months ago, I brought a ShamWow. Does anybody have a ShamWow? I don't even know what it does, but I bought one because it looked cool on TV. The idea here is you have to be the master of your primers. And when you're the master of your primers, and when you help your players to be the master of their primers, that's when they raise their game under pressure. That's when they put in the right juice. And so the idea here is that the next step is you want to create buzzwords. So let's do this with you. We can only do buzzwords today because we don't have time. So what I want you to do is after you, you've written the time you're inspired, look at some of the words that you, you did and circle some key words in the description of the time you're truly inspired. So go ahead and just, just go ahead and write down a description that, uh, I mean, some of the words. 
And those are kind of keys to your buzzwords. And so that's why, if you can, you have your player write it down. I know sometimes you don't have that opportunity. But the idea here is um, you have buzzwords. So let's go back to Bill. What would be a buzzword for you for that situation, the time you're truly inspired? You got him to smile. Got him to smile. And so the, all, so the idea here is that's a great buzzword for you. And the idea is when you're working with a player, you find out when they're truly inspired, and you ask them, OK, let's, come, let's create some uh, buzzwords. And if it's kind of like Bill's story, you could just say, got him to smile, and then work on maybe smile or whatever it is. The idea here is if you have the right buzzwords, and sometimes it takes time, but if you have the right buzzwords, it totally pushes your emotions in the right direction. I, I'll tell you my story. So my story is about 15 years ago, I'm speaking to Millbrook School. It's this fancy dancy school in Upper State, New York. Does anybody know about it? It's a prep school. All the kids go to Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, so you know the type. And most of them can't even play three sports, but they, I'm sorry, most of them can't even play one sport, but they have to play three sports at the school, so you know the type, right? And I'm talking about mental toughness, emotional toughness to them. I'm in this chapel, and as I'm speaking, they're all doing this to me, like you guys are this morning. Right? And as, as they're looking at me, because they're so engaged, I actually moved outside my body. I'm telling them this is true. I moved outside my body, and I said, you're doing a great job, Greg. Way to go. And I'm thinking, why was I so inspired at that moment? It's because I was just sharing my knowledge to them. Um, I wasn't trying to prove myself, like prove how I was a great sports psychologist or whatever. I was just sharing. So my buzzwords are just share. And uh, I think about those kids' faces, because it's ingrained in my mind. And actually, I was in a chapel, so I do this as my action. And I do that every time I go speak. I do that when I work with a client, before I go teach a class. Those pushed my emotions in the right direction, because that was a moment I was truly inspired. So the idea here is that's how I play my life song. And, um, and what was interesting is, going back to that situation um, when I was on Dance with the Stars, they call me up. And they say, would you like to be on Dance with the Stars? I'm like, yeah. We're going to fly to LA. We're going to give you the, the, um, the questions beforehand. So you'd be totally prepared, prepared. And it won't be live. It'll be taped. So when I get there, there's chaos everywhere. I'm not sure what reality shows are like, but there's chaos everywhere. And they say to me, we're not giving you the questions. It's going to be live. I'm like, what? It's like 20 million people. If I make a mistake, I'm, I'm going to look like a total idiot. All of a sudden, my, my heart starts racing. And then I said, Whew. I said, just share, just share. I thought about those kids' faces. And when that light came on, I'm not an actor, but clearly I, I, I did a pretty good job. I don't know if you saw that episode. Is when Barack Obama was dancing with Sarah Palin. OK, that's fake. All right. It looks real, that's fake. All right. But I was on Dance with the Stars. The idea here is um, there's so many powerful ways you can use the technique I'm sharing with you. You can do it as a preset. So uh, maybe for you, you know, you had a tough day before you go into the weight room, you know, tough morning, let's say, with your kids or whatever, and you're going to the weight room, you've got to get that super energy. You can do it as a preset. You can do it as a recharge, right? You just had a tough uh, interaction with a, an athlete, you had a bad attitude, and you just feel, ah, uh, you know, and you've got to get recharged. You can use this as a recharge, and you can do it as a, re um, a uh, basically, well, a reset. And a recharge is also that you, when you go home, you've got to basically have the energy for your, for your kids and for your, your, your spouse. And the idea is you can do it all the time. And, 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 and ultimately, it's about the power of habits. And let me share with you a quote I love. And it's, it's from this book, The Power of Habits. And it says this, there are certain cornerstone habits you must attain first that lead to all the other habits. The cornerstone habits are key to your success in every situation. Well, guess what the cornerstone habit is? It's filling your life full of purpose. That's the habit you must have every day. And everything else will kind of lead you know, in the right direction. You're going to have the passion. You're going to have the grit. You're going to have the energy. But the cornerstone habit you must have is filling your life full of purpose. And that leads to the last thing I want to share with you, and it's called the butterfly effect. And the butterfly effect is this. In the 1960s, this scientist, physicist, came out, and he said the flapping of the wings of a butterfly could change the weather patterns across the globe. Have you heard this? And they said, <laughs> they laughed. And they're like, that's ridiculous. There's no way that could happen. Well, in the 1990s, the physicist said, yes, that's true. Small patterns in one side of the world can have a huge impact on the climate on the other side of the world. We know that. 
Well, that's the same thing that happens with you. You are the butterfly effect. That small changes in your life, like filling your life and having the power of purpose in your life every day, can have a huge impact in your life. And when you work with athletes and you feel their life full of purpose, that small, just you know, asking them their questions when they were inspired and having some key buzzwords can have a huge impact every day, every day in their life. And so you are the butterfly effect. And so the idea here is when you have these amazing habits that you've created, you fill yourself with the right juice so that when you get squeezed, all the right emotions come out. And when you have the right emotions, you master your world. And the last thing I just want to t tell you is this is the university uh, that you're going to get for free. And it's just an online course. It has all these videos, articles. It really has this book, it's this book coming to life, you know, with all the, the sections. And so it's been my pleasure, my honor to speak with you today. And I hope I uh, have uh, created a little change in your life. So have a great day. <laughs>